OK, well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome along to this afternoon's uh, Rushcliffe Borough Council Planning Committee meeting. And uh, it, this is the first meeting of a new committee, a new term, if you like, um, some new faces. In fact, there are more new faces than there are old faces. So welcome, uh, everybody, and also welcome to members of the public as well. Um, just for, for our visitors' information, I'm Councillor Richard Butler. I'm the chairman of the committee. And uh, with me on the top table is my Vice Chairman, Councillor Wells, uh, Mrs Dodd, who is Planning Manager, and also joining us will be Mrs uh, Gaskell, who's a Planning Officer, Mr Taylor and, and Mr Mountain and Mr Pettit, who are all Planning Officers, to discuss the different uh, cases we've got this afternoon. Uh, also with us is our uh, Solicitor, Mrs Walker. Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, we're not expecting any fire alarms or anything like that. So uh, if the, the fire alarms go off, then you can assume it's for real. And uh, we, we just make a quick getaway through the through the doors there, just follow us. Uh, but hopefully that's uh, that, nothing like that will happen uh, this afternoon. So uh, here we are, first meeting of the new committee. So the first item on the agenda is, oh, actually, before I get to that, can I just check with committee members? Have you all received the late representations uh, that were emailed out and uh, got hard copies for us. So we've all seen and got those. Super, thank you. So uh, can we have apologies for absence and substitute members, please? Thank you, Chair. We've got apologies from Councillor Eddie Veen and we have Councillor Phillips as substitute. Councillor Perk is sending her apologies. We've got Councillor Ellis and we've got Councillor Giorgio sending her apologies and we have Councillor Bird. And we've also got Councillor Malinder sending her apologies, but there's no sub. Thank you. OK, thank you for that. And uh, so welcome to the substitute members as well as the uh, the, norm, the usual members of the committee. Uh, I just need to remind everyone that the meeting is being recorded and live streamed on the council's YouTube channel. A recording of the meeting will be available afterwards on the YouTube channel. In addition, under the local authorities, executive arrangements, meetings and access to information, England regulations 2012, other people may film, record, tweet or blog from the meeting. The use of any such images or sound recordings is not under the Council's control. May I remind councillors to, to please switch off your microphones when you're not speaking and also likewise switch them on when you are speaking because they're all connected into the cameras. So um, with uh, that said, we'll go into the uh, next item on the agenda, which is do we, item two, which is do we have any declarations of interest, please? And uh, Councillor Wells. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, I have a declaration of interest for the Stanton Ward. I'm the Ward Councillor. Okay, you're... And uh, Councillor Thomas. Um, I'm previous ward councillor for um, Stanford on Saw, so I'll be standing down for that item. Thank you. OK, thank you. And uh, no, no others. So that's uh, that's fine. And then we go on to the minutes of the previous meeting, which was held way back in March on the 9th of March. And of course, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's new faces on here now. So there are only th uh, three of us on the committee here who are on that committee. So could I have someone to propose the minutes of the previous meeting being correct? Uh, Councillor Phillips and Councillor Thomas, you're happy to second that. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks for that. And I'll uh, sign them later on. So um, we'll move into item four, which is the main reason we're here this afternoon, which is the uh, first of our planning applications. Do you want to answer? Yeah, no, 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 no. So our first application this afternoon is actually a tree preservation order. This is at Stanton on the Wolds uh, Golf Club. And uh, I'll ask Mr. Pettit to talk through the application. Please. Thank you, Councillor Butler. Um, the council has made uh, a tree preservation order at Stanton the Wolds Golf Course, and we're considering an objection to that order. Um, the tree preservation order protects four early mature oak trees and a beech tree on the 16th hole. Um, the trees are located within a wider group of smaller or younger trees um, and are visible from a footpath that runs through the golf course uh, to the south. Um, and you can see uh, some of the images of the trees. Um, so you can see T1, T2, these are the larger trees, and we haven't protected some of the smaller ones they are standing within. Um, the tree preservation order was made following a request from a member of the golf course uh, club who uh, recognised that some changes had taken place to the redesign of the, the course, but they had concerns about the number of mature trees which have 
and are continuing to disappear from the course. And they observed fairly extensive modifications to the golf course in the past couple of years, and in particular, the removal of many mature trees with little consultation and involvement uh, from the membership. So um, they also supplied a plan with a number of uh, red X marks where these, these trees were positioned. Um, we went out to site, uh, we reviewed them, we felt that some of the smaller trees could be thinned out or removed with, with, with little harm to the public amenity. But really there was five trees that really stood out in terms of their quality, their size and their potential to become quite large, important trees. Uh, we received one objection uh, from the owners of the golf club. Um, that They object on the following grounds. The TPO is made following an inquiry from a member of the public without any consultation from the landowner. Uh, there are no plans to fell the trees on the 16th hole and further indigenous tree planting is proposed in this location. In the past, proposals were put forward that would have redesigned uh, this, this course, this hole, um, and that would have re required the removal of the trees, but these changes were subsequently rejected. Um, and actually, the, the length of this hole has been increased, which makes the trees more fundamental to the way it's played. Um, they acknowledge that they can improve communication with their members and they're going to try and keep us involved, um, communicate better with the council to keep us uh, in, um, made aware of possible tree work with a view of us having, you know, not having to make uh, preemptive TPOs. And they advise they have got a felling license from the Forestry Commission, but it relates to only willows, silver birch and spruce. Um, the council's view is that it's entirely appropriate for members of the public to request a tree preservation order. Um, and we, we do make tree preservation orders without consulting the, the landowner. Whilst it might seem a little underhand, um, there's always a risk when it comes to tree preservation orders of trees being felled. So we, um, we make the tree preservation order and then obviously the owners have a right to object and that's what we're considering today. Whilst only one member of the public contacted us about the, the tree work, um, when we advised councillors, one of them advised us that they had received reports of, of tree felling on the golf course and they supported the, the making of the order. Um, it's fairly clear that there's some disagreement between the various parties at the golf course about the appropriateness of the, the redesigns. Um, at a site meeting I had with the golf course after making the TPO, it was um, fairly clear that some trees have been removed, you know, away from public vantage points, but overall it seemed the general amenity of the course was being retained with some signs of tree planting. Um, larger scale felling requires a um, felling license from the Forestry Commission. Uh, the club have secured one, but it only uh, relates to willows, birch and spruce. So whilst more extensive work can take place to those species, all the other tree species on the, the golf course uh, could only be felled in quite small numbers. So really there isn't a risk of it being clear felled, but the, the course can clearly do some, uh, some tree management. Uh, the decision for the committee is to um, uh, decide whether or not the order should be confirmed or in other words made permanent. Uh, whilst it appears that the risk to the trees is low, given selective nature of the TPO, it does not adversely affect how the course is used and it allows some flexibility for the course because not all the trees are protected. Um, Given the concerns raised by the members of the club, confirming the order will earn a side of caution and offer them some peace of mind. Uh, confirming the order will allow future applications be made to, to prune or even fell the trees. And whilst this might be an inconvenience to the club because they will have to plan ahead, it's not considered to be unreasonable and there's no fees connected with the TPO application. And if the council was to refuse a future application, there's a, a right um, to an appeal. Uh, given the importance placed on protecting the environment in the council's corporate strategy and the concerns raised by the members of the public, it's recommended that the uh, Stanton on the World's number one tree preservation order, 2003, be confirmed without modification. Thank you, uh, Mr. Pettit. Um, we don't have any speakers on this item, so we can go straight into uh, discussion, debate and decision. Uh, does anybody have any queries, questions, comments? Uh, Councillor Calvert. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, just uh, one query about it's about the, the process from the request that you get from be it one individual or more to the actual issuing of that TPO. Uh, what's the timeline and is there evidence re required to be submitted by that person who requests the TPO? No, it's, a, it's an informal process. So anybody can request a tree preservation order. 
when we receive a request, you know, they minimum, I'll go and take a look at the trees. Um, the main reason we're protecting trees is their public amenity value. Um, so the trees should be visible from a public vantage point. In this case, I mean, they are part of a wider landscape, but they are visible from the public right of way that runs through the golf course. Um, and then because there's a perceived risk to the trees, we do try and act fairly quickly. So within a couple of weeks, we're usually able to make an order. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ellis. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this seems to me to be a, a, a very sensible um, and reasonable recommendation. And I can't really think of any reason to debate it further. So I'll move officers' recommendations. Thank you, Councillor Ellis. So do you have a seconder for that, uh, Councillor? <laughs> Councillor Phillips, you're happy to second. Do you want to add anything to that? Any comments? Or... I would like to ask just um, the, the approximate age of the trees, the oak trees. Oh, I hate questions like that. <laughs> um, I would say 40 to 50 years. They're still quite young. They're, they're going to get um, bigger. So they've got at least uh, 150 years, 100 years probably life left. If, if they have a good a good spell. So, so the layout of the golf course could change quite a bit over 40 to 50 years. And what we can't do is keep chopping trees down and replanting. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I really think these trees have got the potential to give that course a, a lot of character as they mature. Um, they're the kind of trees that you really value, I think. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Um, you, 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 Councillor Walker, you're, you're looking puzzled and I, I get the you want to ask something, I can tell. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Councillor Walker. Um, what's the test for deciding whether to, met, to, to, met, to make one in the first place? Um, the test is, is it expedient in the interest of public amenity? So expedient, is it the right thing to do? Is there a risk? Public amenity basically boils down to how visible the trees are. Um, we're, we're probably at the, I mean, the trees are I don't know, 70 metres from the, the public right of way. So, you know, but they are still entirely visible from, from members of the public. Hence the reason to, to make the order. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I don't think that there's probably no one else who wanted to speak on this. We've, we've heard the report. We've had the report moved and seconded. Uh, let's uh, have a vote to see who's in favour of the recommendation as on per the report. Please show your hands. So I think that's unanimous, isn't it? So just for the, re just for the record, no one against, uh, no. So that's uh, permission, the, 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 the order is, is approved, uh, recommend, as per the recommendation in the report. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Pettit. Right, so we'll move on to the uh, next item, which is the uh, first of our sort of actual planning applications for today. And uh, this is land at the former RAF Newton uh, on Wellington Avenue at Newton, Nottinghamshire. And uh, Mr. Taylor, you're going to lead us through this, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, members are advised that there have been late reps received for this application, and I'm uh, mindful that you've had the papers in respect to that. Just very briefly, one additional objection letter from the local community that didn't raise any new issues and uh, clarification from the Highway Authority with regards to the age and the validity of the transport statements that have been submitted. Uh, so the application before members this afternoon is a reserved matters application. Um, it forms part of the Newton Sustainable Urban Extension. Uh, and the application is described as a commercial building in the planning statement that's clarified that it's for a B8 use. Now, for those less familiar with the technical terminology, B8 is a storage and distribution. So probably more commonly known as a warehouse to, to members of the committee. Um, the application is a large building. There's two, no two ways around it. Um, and the building is proposed to accommodate a relatively small area of first floor office accommodation. Total internal floor area of the building is circa 14,000 square metres at ground floor with a 700 square metre mezzanine floor at first floor. 
uh, and the building would measure approximately 153 metres in length, 92 metres in width, and would be 13 and a half metres high to its ridge. Uh, as you'll see from the, the plan on the screen, the, the red line indicates the area where the proposal uh, relates to in relation to the aerial photography is beginning to show there's a bit of a lag between what's on site and when the aerial photography was taken, but shows you the residential development to its north northwest that's taking place at the moment by Red Row Homes. Uh, as I say, the site is allocated within the local plan part one under policy 22 for, amongst other things, the retention of the existing hangars and for employment purposes, uh, sorry, for employment purposes, and the provision of around 6.5 hectares of additional land for B1, B2 and B8 purposes. And again, for those less familiar with planning terms, at the time, those use classes would have covered light industry, heavy industry and storage and distribution. So that's what B1, B2 and B8 relate to. Uh, the site benefits from outline planning permission for, amongst other things, up to 5.22 hectares. That's 52,200 square metres of new employment use within those B1, B2 and B8 uses. The building is proposed to be sited at the southern end of the allocated site in an area indicated for employment on both the local plan and also on the illustrative master plan that formed part of the approved outline permission. And they're the two documents on the screen. So the document on the left is the extract from the local plan documents. And the area in question is the uh, blue rectangle towards uh, the south eastern corner of the site and similarly the, the image alongside that is part of the illustrative master plan and on that image it's the brown rectangular area of land. Um, to the site north is the new residential development that I showed you on the aerial photography and I will take you on a photographic tour around the site shortly um, and that site's currently being constructed by Red Row Homes and comprises 528 new dwellings. To the site east is an area of land that's currently undeveloped uh, within the allocation, but is um, earmarked for the location of the pedestrian cycle bridge over the A46. Um, to the south is the A46, and beyond that, the strategic allocation for Bingham, which is also currently under construction by another housing developer, or rather a number of housing developers. And it's also noteworthy that the Bingham SUE um, includes an area of around 15.5 hectares of employment land within its allocation as well, and that's benefits from outline planning permission as well. Um, to the site's west is open countryside. The site is currently undeveloped, so that's the, the redlined area that we're being asked to consider this afternoon, um, um, and comprises areas of hard sanding where former buildings and engineering features previously existed. However, the site is relatively flat and is surrounded by a mixture of trees and hedgerows along its boundaries. To the southern end of the application site is a lorry yard with parking for 35 HGVs to be used for loading and unloading of the deliveries to and collecting from the proposed building. And at the northern end of the building is proposed a car park comprising 122 parking spaces for workers, employees within the building. Uh, cycle and motorcycle parking is also proposed. As such, two access points off Newton Lane are proposed as part of this application. Uh, the agenda report sets out the concerns of the parish and the then ward councillor, and I'm mindful that both the parish council and the current ward member are registered to speak to you today. Um, the proposal has been revised during its consideration, with the building being moved approximately 10 metres further south, in increasing the separation distance to the closest residential property. This has also allowed for a widening of a proposed landscaped area at the same northern end of the building, which also incorporates a bunded area, uh, landscaped with standard and heavy standard trees being proposed. Uh, the design of the building has also been revised with the mass reduced through the incorporation of a flat roofed area at the northern end of the building that would accommodate the proposed office accommodation. Applications attracted a significant level of objection from the local community and the objections are summarised in the report with full links to the versions uh, on the electronic version you'll have been sent available on the website. Uh, members should be aware that at the heart of the NPPF, which is the National Planning Policy Framework, there is a presumption in favour of sustainable development. That presumption requires officers to work with the applicants to address concerns raised by technical consultees, by officers themselves and by other parties raised during the application process. Officers and technical consultees did have initial concerns, but through those discussions with the applicants, these issues have been addressed and overcome. 
Members will note that there are no technical objections to the proposal being raised by the consultees and officers are satisfied that the application before you does comply with the policies in the local plan. Um, I'll now take members on a virtual site visit around the site, starting on Newton Lane, which, if the cursor appears on the screen, is a bit of a lag. Apologies, the, the access road here. And I'll take you in a general clockwise direction around the perimeter of the site, slightly along the bridle way, extending alongside the A46, then back and along the access road into the site. So you can see the site in relation to its, its context and its surroundings. So... Two images per slide, Chairman. Uh, the first image is, is taken with my back to a woodland area. Uh, on the right-hand side of the image is the show homes that face towards the application site, and the image to its immediate right shows those show homes in a slightly clearer fashion. Um, there's also a balancing pond that exists to the frontage of those, those show homes. Stepping forward, left-hand image, we're now on the path to the frontage of those show homes. And turning left through 90 degrees, you'll see the balancing pond in front of you and the application site just beyond that. Uh, the left-hand image shows we've walked to the far corner of the, the, the path to the frontage of the show homes, again, looking back across wider vistas of the balancing pond and the application site. And we'll move generally along the footpath that's on the right-hand edge of the left-hand image uh, down towards the A46. Uh, members will note that the site has been fenced off for security reasons, uh, and this is the footpath that runs along the edge of that site, so the site is within the, the fenced off area. Again, turning right, you, you look across the open countryside, so uh, looking generally towards Saxondale with the A46 running across the horizon of that image, and then turning back left 90 degrees, we move along the footpath and pop out. Uh, with the A46 in front of us, you'll notice the HGV cab and trailer just passing uh, in left to right in that image. Uh, at the end of this footpath, we'll turn right and then spin round 90 degrees to look back towards the site across the, the open countryside, the field that we, we looked out across in the, the previous set of images. And then stepping forward along the track in that image, we come to the... The, the edge of the footpath we popped out along and again members will note the A46 on the right hand side of the image and the application site is broadly behind the, the hedgerow that's on the left hand side of the right hand image. Moving forward along this path again note the uh, A46 to the left, the site to the right and then at the end of that path you'll see there's a, a red sign at which generally we turn to our left and you're on the access road that is uh, Newton Lane accessing the southern end of the site. So the application site is broadly in front of you in this image. Again, passing along the path, the application site is within this area here. Access point is generally in, coming off in this, this location here to the, to the HGV lorry park. And then turning 180 degrees back, you just see where we've walked from. Again, you see the A46 and the Bingham development um, just on the edge of that image there. Turning back again, 180 degrees, traveling along the path, um, you'll notice that there's um, different densities of, of landscaping along this boundary of the site. So in certain areas it's open and others it's, it's better landscaped. Um, application site is again to the left-hand side of the, of the fence line within this area here. And you'll start to notice the uh, show homes that we showed at the start of the, the virtual site visit appearing in both these images. Again, just generally moving along the access road into the development site. Um, image on the left-hand side um, is an approximate distance from the northern edge of the building in relation to the show homes. Separation distance measures building to building to be circa 132 metres. And to give residents, uh, sorry, to give members an understanding of what that separation distance looks like in a photograph, I'm stood at the approximate sort of front northern facade of the proposed building. And again, uh, turning back through 180 degrees, looking back along Newton Lane, you will notice that the application location of the, the variety of traffic that accesses this development, because there are a number of hangars at the northern end of the site, which are also in a commercial use. So you'll see there's an HGV heading out of the site down towards the A46. Um, again, just to assist members, as part of the, um, the approval for the housing development for Red Row Homes, uh, that includes houses in proximity to hangars on the site. And again, 
these two images just show an indication of development that's already been approved in relation to larger buildings on the site. Um, I've also been asked to include this photograph by Councillor Solomon again to show HGVs coming in and in this case out of the development site. Um, taking members through some photographs. So here we are at the southern end of the site, the bit that was initially outlined on the first image in red. The blue rectangle is the proposed building, the HGV lorry park at generally the southern end of it, the car parking for the, for the employees at the northern end of it, the balancing pond I showed you, and the frontage of, of, of residential properties that are currently being used as show homes for the housing developer along there with the residential development beyond it. Um, again, some floor plans, some internal plans to show the building. So um, the warehouse occupying the, the ground floor with the mezzanine proposed uh, in an L-shaped configuration in that corner of the building. And again, uh, an indication of the, the proximity of the building and the, the location of the, the two relative parking areas in proximity to the existing road and the residential form. Uh, elevations of the proposed building. So again, it is a large building. There's no two ways around that. 153 metres in length, 92 metres in width, 13 and a half metres in height to the ridge. And again, just an indication of the parking areas, uh, an indication of some of the proposed fencing to surround the site, indication of compound areas for bins and such like, cycle storage areas, uh, which would be located or proposed to be located alongside the access to the employee's car park. Indication of the proposed bun. So officers have asked for a section through the site. So this would be the front, the northern end of the building where uh, officer photographs stood showing you looking towards the, the show home area. This area would be the employee parking. There's then proposed to be a bund with landscaping on top of it. There's then a drainage ditch the balancing pond I showed members and the front facade of the show homes that face currently towards the site. So that separation distance is circa 132 metres building to building. Again, an indication of landscaping proposed on the site and there are more technical detailed plans. Uh, the numbers of, of plants, trees and shrubs are set out in the report members. Uh, I'm mindful you will have read them and I haven't memorised them. Um, also an indication of the, the access road that I brought you along walking back into the site and the locations of the access point to serve the HGV lorry park as proposed and the access to serve the employee parking area. And the applicants have submitted some visuals to give you an indication as to what the proposal might look like in the setting. So this would be the access in to the HGV lorry park area. So having come around the bend at the bottom of Newton Lane, in the approach to the SUE. Um, and again, um, approximate location of where my first photograph was taken. So the show homes would be to the right hand side of this image facing towards this, which is the northern end of the building. And again, as I referred to in the, the revisions, you'll notice that the building's been stepped down at the northern end of the building as a, an attempt to reduce its mass uh, and bulk. Um, that's just a plan showing the location of the cycle networks in relation to the application site. So the application site sits in here. Uh, this is the A46 trunk road. Uh, and forgive me, I appreciate it's probably not the clearest image on this, but there are a series of networks of cycle routes that come partway along and then join the bridleway that runs up to the access point. Um, there is no uh, bridleway, it, it is on road cycle along Newton Lane until you get to the northern end where there's a bridleway footway again before it joins National Cycle Path 48 running across the 46. Um, members, the site is allocated within a local plan. Uh, the application benefits from outline planning permission for the proposed use. Therefore, the principle of this planning use has been accepted on this site. Officers fully acknowledge that the proposal is for a large building. However, it's not uncommon for modern warehouse buildings to be this big and in many cases bigger. Members are also reminded that in planning, we deal with uses, not users. Therefore, although we don't know who the end user is, this is not uncommon. And for planning purposes, that information is not required to determine the application. 
uh, as an example, we would deal with retail uses. So application may come in from Sainsbury's. It doesn't necessarily mean that Sainsbury's going to occupy that building. They could sell it to another operative, whether that be another supermarket or another retail user. Uh, none of the technical consultees are objecting to the proposal, and notably the Highway Authority of not objecting, and colleagues in environmental health do not consider the proposal would warrant or cause any amenity issues. Uh, the outline permission has many conditions that cover issues such as lighting, the need for a construction method statement to control issues of noise, dust and vibration during any demolition and construction process, uh, hours of operation uh, to be submitted, details of any plant machinery, externally venting, uh, mechanical operations within the building, uh, all to be submitted and approved uh, before development commences. Uh, application is before members this afternoon because the former ward member objected to the proposal. And uh, obviously I suspect that may have been largely triggered by, uh, amongst other things, the number of objections from the local residents. Um, concerns of residents are noted and understood and the site is at the southern entrance of the development and has always been allocated for such an employment use. Therefore, officers are recommending that members approve the application as per the conditions in the agenda. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Taylor. That was uh, very comprehensive. And uh, we have uh, two speakers for this item uh, who wish to uh, make comments about the application. We, we have uh, Margaret Goulder, who is uh, is Margaret here? Mar Margaret, if you'd like to come and sit at the chair there. And uh, I, th I think you're from the parish council. Are you from the Yeah, chair of New uh, Newton Parish Council. And the way it works is you've got up to five minutes to talk to the committee. Um, and uh, we have to be quite strict on the timing. So if you're still speaking at five minutes, we have to say timer. Five minutes can either seem a very long time or a very quick time, depending on what you say. So, so don't worry about it. Uh, as soon as you're you're ready, press the right hand button. The red light will come on, and you can start talking to us. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, Newton Parish Council will sent uh, documents out to most of you, which I hope you've read through, and more importantly, I hope you looked at the photographs that we sent, because they're not quite as sterile as the ones you've just seen which show um, the countryside, but they don't show you HGVs on one section of Newton Lane, which I think uh, is quite pertinent to this. As you're aware, the planning application has received over 200 objections. The plan submitted with the application shows the exit from the commercial centre does not restrict HGVs turning right into it or left out of it. HGVs will then have access to the whole of Newton Lane. So they'll be able to then access Hunter Road, which runs, which is a principal road within Red Rose Development. That will then give them access onto Wellington Avenue and then into the village of Newton. And this is a far quicker route to get out in the evenings onto the A6097. And HGVs have already been seen using Hunter Road to get down to Wellington Avenue, even though Red Row have tried to mitigate this. In the, your local Rushcliffe plan part one and two, it covers transport, green infrastructure, environment, biodiversity, etc. We realise that the applicant can ask for permission without saying who's going to use the building. But how can you as a committee make an appropriate and informed decision based on Rushcliffe's own criteria if you don't know who's going to be using the building and what its operating hours are. In the submission application in 2019, it states no new commercial development will commence until the link road, which is now Newton Lane, has been widened to 7.3 metres. The picture that you've just seen with the HGV on it, that section is 7.3 metres wide. If you come down to the bend and head towards Newton Island, it's not, it's only six metres wide. Newton Nottingham LLP have kept talking and resubmitting plans, but the residents will have to live with your decision. As you can see from the photographs, there's no safe route for pedestrians or cyclists to leave the village. At a national and local level, more housing is required, but buying a property sandwiched between two commercial areas is not only undesirable, but it's dangerous. 
The residents were very grateful for the support of Rushcliffe Borough Council when the working hours for the hangers were restricted. Unfortunately, these are being broken and we are not getting any support in enforcing the hours. We will no doubt have the same if the commercial centre goes ahead. The application could see HGVs driving around a residential area 24 hours a day. It may not be an important part of planning, but it is for the sake of the residents in Newton who are entitled to a quiet and peaceful environment when they get home. One thing also to bear in mind is when this building's up and running, will it be one HGV in 24 hours or 24 HGVs every hour? Based on all that, the people of Newton say, please, will you refuse this application? Thank you. Thank you very much. That's well within your five minutes, so thank you for that. Uh, our next speaker on this is the ward member, uh, who is Councillor Solomon. And welcome. This is your first meeting as well, so it's a new experience for you for you too. So um, it's uh, as you as you know, you've got up to, up to five minutes to talk to us, and um, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, as councillor for Newton Ward, I'm speaking against the granting of the planning permission for the commercial building with the outlined consideration conditions as they stand. If a new planning application for a village design was submitted, incorporating five large hangars at the back of the village, and then an even larger commercial building at the front, with hundreds of residential houses sandwiched in between. But the issue is the daily occurrence of large lorries travelling right through the heart of it. But this issue is about the potential for even more lorries to go through. And I doubt if that came to planning with that, it would be denied. Uh, it would be denied based on residential immunity. So this is the situation that's evolved in Newton. Therefore, it would not be appropriate to let a flawed outcome end up in effect simply by an evolution of planning being granted without the needed considerations. I'm going to concentrate on the material matters that affect the request, but with limited time, I'm going to speak and focus on access, traffic and road safety. The current application includes parking for 35 lorries. With the design, there is the potential for these lorries to turn out of the commercial development and go either right or left. The vehicle outline and direction of travel plan with the info pack um, clearly shows that that's possible. The expectation is for lorries to turn right onto the part of Newton Lane parallel with the A46 that requires widening down to the roundabout and then to access the A46. There is no restriction on the ability of lorries to turn left and into the village. Travel down Newton Lane is also the expected exit route of the lorries traveling from the five warehouses at the back of the village. Item 76 in the briefing documents on the residential amenity state, however, access to the existing hangars to the northern edge of the Sioux and to the proposed new development on the southern edge of the Sioux are solely by Newton Lane. This is incorrect. There are lorries from the hangars actively driving through the village via Hunter Road and Wellington Avenue now. The restrictive measures outlined in paragraph 76 to 79 and proposed do not achieve the restrictions required. Residents report that the occurrence of lorries travelling through the village is increasing, particularly at peak traffic congestion times for accessing the A46. It's clear lorries are avoiding this congestion and taking this alternative route through the village to access the A6097 directly. Significantly, they are also operating outside of the restricted hours. Therefore, the expectation is that at peak congestion times, and with lorries able to turn left out of the new commercial development, that they will, and drive into the heart of the village and exit via Wellington Avenue also. To mitigate this, I suggest an additional condition is necessary around the access design from the commercial development to prevent lorries from turning left and into the village. 
Additionally, it's clear that the measures referred to in paragraph 77 to 79 of the briefing document have not been successful in preventing lorries travelling through the heart of the village. I note that in a previous application, there was the proposal of a bus gate on Hunter Road. I believe this would have been a digital measure recording access by lorries entering Wellington Avenue and result in a fine. A previous variation to planning variation included the removal of the proposed bus gate. It's unclear why what could be a very effective restriction was removed. I consider that the reversal of this removal of the proposed bus gate is appropriate. The inclusion of both these restrictions to lorry traffic would make the commercial application more socially and environmentally sustainable. Road safety is a key concern. The planned increase in residential development will result in more children in the village, up to 300, plus the expectation for a school to be built. The route of the lorries through Wellington Avenue is in direct conflict with the school drop-off and pick-up points and can occur at these peak times. School days. holidays are an issue as well. Uh, so children out and about causing a real concern for if lorries continue to and are able to, as a consequence of being able to turn left out of the commercial development, travel through the heart of Newton. Outline planning has been granted for this application already, and this is in line with the planned mixed use in the area. However, it is the access detail that is important in this application to mitigate the material considerations I have raised so there is a sustainable outcome. Thank you. Thank you, you Councillor Solomon. Uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, just don't worry about the timing too much. That was that was fine because we were a little bit under with with uh, uh, with uh, Mrs. Golder. So, <laughs> okay, thank you for that. Uh, so, if, uh, if you pop back to to the side there. So uh, we we uh, so yes, we've heard from our uh, two guest speakers. So, Mrs. Golder from the parish council. Uh, refer to the photographs and uh, refer to the, in particular, worries about the HGVs on Newton Way, and also it doesn't doesn't agree that the, or says that the plans don't show proper exit or the appropriate or correct exit details, and there is worry about access to uh, both now and in the future of lorries onto Wellington Avenue, Newton Lane. Um, with no clarification about operating hours and the type of use of building, although I appreciate that we've been told that we, we don't know who's going to use the building, but we know the type of use. And, uh, and uh, also there's concern about 24 hours a day of lorry movements throughout the development. And the Council of Solomon similarly uh, is against the application that stands and the major concerns about the lorries again and uh, access onto the road, road safety, and, uh, and Newton Lane and Wellington Road again are referred to, and uh, also told us about lorries going onto the A6097. And uh, Councillor Solomon also mentioned a previous uh, reference to a bus gate, which was uh, no longer referred to. Um, so I think those are the main points that our visitors have picked up on. Could you help us out with those, please? Of course, Chairman. Uh, let's get the microphone a little closer. Uh, if I Deal with them one at a time um, and please prompt me if I miss any because I, I think I've noted them, but I noticed you've got a list as well. Uh, in terms of um, hours of operation for any ultimate user, should the building be permitted today, uh, condition 33 on the outline consent says no new non-residential unit shall be occupied until a scheme has been submitted to and approved and agreed in writing by the Borough Council to cover the following. And there are five bullet points, one of which is hours of operation of those premises. So it is covered on the outline consent. Uh, another one of those bullet points is hours of deliveries taken at or dispatched from and details of waste collection. So that issue is covered on the existing outline consent chair. Um, in terms of um, potential for an additional condition to prevent lorries turning left, um, it's not something that colleagues at the Highway Authority have requested or required. Nevertheless, if members felt that that was pertinent in their determination of the application today and was something they wanted to see, 
I see no reason why a condition couldn't be drafted requiring details to be submitted. I'm mindful we would need to run them by colleagues at the County Council to ensure that they were appropriate and weren't going to have any further knock on implications in terms of highway safety, pedestrian visibility, things like that. But I, I think that would. And that discussion could be had. That discussion could be had. Yes. And I don't think it would be unreasonable to propose such a condition yep. if that's ultimately where members arise at. In terms of traffic using Hunter Road and ultimately down to Wellington Road, um, we are aware of the issue and I'm mindful that colleagues in the enforcement team have been looking into this. I'm also mindful that Hunter Road is not fully constructed up to its, its finished dress course level so that the surface tarmac, the road markings and things like that. Ultimately, there will be traffic calming measures. And I also understand that the roundabout there, you've got the, the perimeter, the outline curb stones for the roundabout that will ultimately be at that junction. But uh, certainly the last time I was up there a couple of weeks ago, the technical term coming up, the blob in the middle <laughs> was not there. Um, and as part of the outline consent, um, members previously determined that that would be designed with geometry to prevent lorries turning down Hunter Road. Now, I'm mindful that that's not in place yet. But ultimately, as part of that outline consent, there are measures in place. And I'm mindful that Red Row have implemented some measures or attempted to implement some measures in terms of temperature canes to try and discourage HGVs from using that route out of the site. But I fully acknowledge that I've got no reason to dispute what anyone said to me about HGVs potentially doing that. Ultimately, if highways and the applicant are required to put a no left turn out of this, that should prevent any issues arising from this proposal. And with the passage of time, the completion of the highway works as part of the reserve matters for the housing development will also discourage the HGVs that have to travel along Newton Lane to the hangars at the moment from being able to do that manoeuvre as well. Okay. Um, bus gates, yes, I did have to refresh my memory on this one, Chairman. I did have to dig out the previous committee papers because it was brought before the planning committee back in February 2020 which is why it probably wasn't at the immediate forefront of my mind. It was a request as part of a variation and not the first variation I would add to the outline planning commission um, from Red Row Homes and Newton LLP as joint applicants, but ultimately it was for Red Row Homes to build their housing and for Newton LLP to have the commercial end of the wider developments as, a, as joint applicants. Um, the application was to vary um, 17 of the conditions and remove one of them. And as one of those uh, other measures, it was an application to remove the bus gate. Now, the cover letter that came in from Red Row Homes referred to a public exhibition held on Wednesday, 27th of February 2019, between 3.30 in the afternoon and 7.30 in the evening, at a building on site, the former security lodge, which is no longer there. Uh, the Parish Council were also uh, kind to distribute leaflets to all properties in Newton, inviting them to attend the event. And this was a public consultation event prior to the variations being sought uh, for, the, for the Red Row Homes application. Um, residents were asked to comment on a number of uh, factors, including um, details of sort of location of primary school, general configuration of housing and such matters. Um, they advised that circa 180 people attended the event and 58 responses were received. Um, many responses, as you might anticipate, in relation to HGV traffic and also in relation to the proposed bus gate removal. Um, Red Road considered, and this was part of the reason for, for this element of the application, was to remove the bus gate because they felt it would segregate the new development from the existing development in terms of having a, a physical barrier in the way um, and we assessed the application on its merits. There was a very detailed um, report at the time, lots of transport assessments to submit that, but ultimately it was a request from Red Row Homes on amenity grounds to remove that. Um, so that, that's the reason for that, Chair. Thank you. Yes, I think we, we've covered everything that was raised by, by our, our guests. So we can now open up for discussion and debate. We, we, we've had the presentation, we've got the report, we've heard some of the details. Um, any comments, questions, Councillor Thomas, please? Uh, yes, I've got six things. Um, 
if I can run through them. <clears throat> I think they, maybe seven actually, maybe the, you've, um, the officer has suggested that it would be possible to have a condition um, to restrict turning left or to, to come up with proposals to restrict turning left. And I would suggest that if we are um, approving this, this application, that that should be included. Uh, also, um, some sort of provision to prevent HGVs um, using the road at the top of that Wellington drive. Um, should, could, could that not just be a pro prohibition for that road for, for HGVs? Um, so I think there's work to be done to uh, manage the flow of HGVs around the site um, in general. Um, <clears throat> the core strategy policy on this um, development um, says that the new link road must be widened and that has to be carried out prior to the use of the now employ the new employment development. So is that part of is that widening of that road part of this application or has it already been done? Um, so um, that, that's a question really. Um, the um, core strategy uh, policy also says that this is for high quality employment. And the employment land is for B1, B2 and B8 purposes. Now, this is solely B8. It doesn't say B1, B2 or B8. It, it implies a mixture, really. B8 is the employment purpose that, that creates the least number of jobs per metre squared, um, as I understand it. Um, so, um, you know, is, is this development actually satisfying its ambitions to create employment in this in this area um, <clears throat> my next thing is the environmental cred credentials of the building <clears throat> Do we have any information on that uh, for instance are there any plans to put solar panels on this vast expanse of roof and i think the operating hours you've covered uh, the other question i had was the uh, footpath along the side and the distance between that and the building and and how um, aggressive that will be uh, for footpath users. So I think those are my questions and commentary. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. There's quite, quite a list there and uh, un perfectly understandable questions. Can you help point us in the right direction? I know there's no pun <laughs> None taken, Chair. Um, in, in terms of um, traffic along Wellington Avenue, um, I, I'm mindful that there there was a, a traffic regulation order required as part of the outline consent. Now, whether that's in place or not, I would need to check with colleagues at the County Council, but there is already um, that provision within the outline consent. I hear what the parish say, I hear what the community say in terms of its effectiveness, and that might be partly because it's not in place yet, but it, it, it is a measure that is secured through the, through the outline consent, but I will certainly check with colleagues at the county if, if there's anything that can be done to expedite that if it's, if it's not currently in place. Um, in terms of the core strategy requirements to widen Newton Lane, um, those works have not been undertaken yet, but they are again covered by the outline consent. Um, I think it's condition, I'm not going to guess, let me look it up. Um, certainly one of the conditions in there requires it prior to the first occupation of any new B1, B2, B8 use operating on the site. So although it doesn't form part of this application per se, it is encapsulated in the outline consent, therefore it is part of the, the wider application. Um, B1, B2, B8 mix. Um, yes, it is an application for almost entirely a B8 use. You are quite correct. There is a first floor office accommodation and an indication of 122 parking spaces within the employee car park area. So that, that certainly implies a level of employment within that. I think it's also worth pointing out that it's not the only area designated um, for employment uses. There is also an area sort of wrapping around sort of the, the middle of the, the hangars at the, at the northern end of the site that's also within the application. So there are opportunities for other applications to come forward with the fullness of time. Obviously, members must determine what's before them today. Um, question about uh, environmental credentials, solar panels. Um, there's nothing proposed within the application, but again, as with potential restrictions on left-hand turns, if members felt it was pertinent and um, 
imperative that their, their decision relied on such matters, then again, we could uh, invite the applicant to submit a scheme of details. Yeah. Um, I'm mindful that um, I don't know what the, the construction methodology, the weight of panels and things like that, but again, I don't think that it would be unreasonable to, to request details to be submitted as, as part of the proposal. Yeah. Finally, in terms of the footpath, I know there was an initial concern raised by colleagues in the rights of way team. Um, they had a fairly lengthy discussion with the applicants about clarifying the distance. Forgive me, I don't have that measurement to hand, but what I can advise is they were not objecting to the proposal following that clarification. Okay. Thank you, that's, that's very helpful. Does that help Councillor Thomas? Yes, and um, I think the thing about the um, widening of the road is, but if it's um, not included in this application, are there plans already drawn up for it? Um, how, have they been approved by highways? I can see a long delay uh, between um, you know, the road as it is and the road as it will be widened. Um, and the timescales for achieving that compared with the timescales of this build, I can't see that it's going to be ready in time. And then there will be another variation or a relaxation or whatever um, to enable the... Um, um, proposal to be used without um, um, the widening of the road, which does seem to be completely unacceptable as far as I can see. Um, so uh, could there not be some sort of um, process whereby this application is deferred to get those plans in place so that, so, so that we know when they're happening, um, so, so that the road will be wider? And indeed, there's no footpath or cycle path along that stretch either. That needs to be looked at as well. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, the, the condition forms part of the outline application. Yeah. That is part of this collective application, if I can put it in those terms. I always describe it as you need both halves. You need your outline consent and your reserve matters before you can lawfully implement. And you can only do that, i.e. lawfully start on site, once you have discharged the relevant conditions. The condition is prior to first occupation for those works to be completed. Uh, I'm just checking through the conditions to find the exact wording. Condition 14, thank you very much. So condition 14, uh, no development on new commercial land falling within use classes B2 and B8, as defined in the Town and Country Planning Act, um, shall be occupied until Newton Link Road has been widened to generally 7.3 metres with additional widening on the bends. So that's a requirement. That was a request from colleagues at the County Council Highways Department as part of the application. Um, that is a condition on the outline consent, which would form part of the determination of this application before this afternoon. Thank you. So again, a lot, a lot, a lot of this has been covered and agreed in the outline at the permission in the first place, hasn't it? So, 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 a lot of the questions are answered as, as a result of of that. So, so the the, the protection and the requirements are there. Um, Right. Uh, just for clarification, we, we've heard and we've seen from the plans, it, as, and as you said, it is a very large building, uh, and we have to accept that. Uh, I note that the uh, it's been stepped down a little bit to uh, to to soften soften the appearance of it. But for clarification, really, and, I'm, and I'm, we have referred to this, but just for clarification, really, if it wasn't this one big building, is it quite feasible that there could be a few? large buildings because at the end of the day that that section is has been put specifically for this type of use just for clarification really yes chairman um the, the allocation is clearly a wash on the local plan uh allocation and on the illustrative master plan at that point um none of us could have predicted whether it comes forward as one or more than one building what I would add, say is uh, there were no restrictions within the outline consent that said it, it could not be just a single building or that it had to be multiple buildings. I'm also mindful that some of the, some, some of the conditions refers to units and that's partly because it allows for that flexibility and that option, yeah. but also because there are two areas of commercial development shown within the allocation and as part of the application plan. Thank you. And it's, so it's quite feasible. And if, 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 if there were more, more than one building there, you can have a multitude of different HGV tasks and operations going on, which may or may not be helpful. Uh, Councillor Walker. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I agree with Councillor Thomas. I think that um, HGV access, ingress and egress should be restricted to um, the access road. I can't see that 
to my mind, the uh, the proposal is acceptable without that, notwithstanding that um, highways haven't, haven't objected, but from a residential amenity perspective, I think that's important. Um, and as I understand it, they, you know, that although this reserve matters application doesn't um, doesn't cover the widening of the road, that's already covered elsewhere. Um, one thing we haven't talked about yet is the screening. Uh, paragraph 64, um, the input of the landscape office, officers um, is referenced. Uh, my attention was drawn to two particular words in the, in the quotation there, which is the use twice of the word should, um, and that the, the screening should ultimately do what it's needed to, to be. Um, that, that the inference there being that there's a possibility that it doesn't. So what can we do to ensure, not that it should, but that it does? The answer to that, Chairman, is um, I, I suspect the word should has been used because trees age, trees die, trees become diseased. Um, conditions will um, allow for that generally within the first five years of planting. So if any trees become damaged, it used to be dead, dying, diseased yes. or dangerous that they had to be replaced yeah. by the applicant yeah. uh, of a suitable species with details to be submitted to us. Um, it is a large building. Um, yes, a lot of landscaping is proposed, but I'm not going to sit here before you and tell you it's going to disappear behind the forest. Um, the building will be visible. Um, yes, trees will get bigger. Yes, they will be in leaf at this time of year in six months time. Some may, some may not. Um, so I suspect both of those factors is why the landscape officer has used the word should, not would, because he cannot guarantee that. Good. OK, helpful. Yes, Councillor um, uh, Ellis, please. And, and then Councillor Calvert. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, there were 225 local objectors and uh, only two in support. The 225 between them came up with 24 reasons for objections. But having listened to the, um, the debate so far, it, it seems that the real uh, concerns are HGVs, obviously enough, we've, we've done that to death, um, and local safety. I see no reason whatsoever why between the borough and the county council, there shouldn't be sufficient restrictions put in place to solve the HGV and safety problems. And if they were put in place, I would be minded to support this application. Thank you, Councillor Ellis. Well, we, we have referred to the, the possibility and the, or indeed the probability of putting some uh, 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 extra uh, risk, uh, uh, conditions in. So we've, we've that is within members' gift. Yeah. So, 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 if members are quite happy with that, uh, you're you're basically moving the recommendation. But before we do that, I, I know Councillor Calvert wanted to say something as well. So, um, so we'll hold that thought for a moment. But Councillor Councillor Calvert, thank you, Chair. Uh, I've got three major concerns that I want to raise. Uh, I think you will have heard some of this before. Uh, the first one is on the size of the proposed building. The second concern regards the traffic generation. And thirdly, uh, just some commentary on the reference to a garden village. So coming to the size of the proposed building, uh, which is the massing scale and proportion and its impact on the amenity of local residents, paragraph 84 of the report compares the size of the existing five hangars in the village with the proposed building. It concludes that this application proposes similar relationships between residential properties and large buildings to those already existing, which seems to me to be implying that the, the hangars that uh, currently exist are of a similar scale to the new building. Looking at the statistics that are quoted uh, in paragraph five and, and paragraph 84, we see that the length of the proposed building is 70% longer than the hangar, hangar buildings. The width is 
larger, 92 metres compared with 46 metres, and also uh, it is slightly higher uh, than the hangar. So to me, this does not seem to be a similar relationship. And that furthermore, there's an argument that a small village with five existing large hangars is the last place deserving of another even larger building. Secondly, on the traffic generation, the lack of traffic generation information relating to the use of the proposed building. My concern is that the potential traffic generation arising from the 35 HGV parking bays and 122 car parking spaces proposed. All I have to go on to assess how much traffic uh, is going to uh, uh, occur uh, is relates to paragraphs 91 and 92, which describe the trip rate information computer system tricks. Uh, this, I call it box of tricks, is supposed to assure us that the traffic generated by HGVs and cars will not have a major impact on the village. The late representation from the Highways Authority states that a trip rate was agreed, uh, which the Highways Agency were satisfied with. But what assumptions have been made? For example, how many HGVs are likely to come and go to and from the site in the course of one day, which is a, an issue that was raised by uh, the parish councillor. The late representation from the Highways uh, Authority states that a trip rate was agreed, which the Highways Authority was satisfied with. I'm not sure that this gives enough assurance to those objecting to the proposal. Finally, uh, just a commentary about uh, the reference to a garden village. The term, uh, paragraph 70 states, uh, the term garden village has been used as a marketing strategy by the housing developer in Newton Village. It seems to be a worthy aspiration. <laughs> um, paragraph 71, uh, which is quoting from a Town and Country Planning Association document that without providing the right employment, community facilities and range of housing, new garden villages risk becoming a dormitory commuter suburbs, the antithesis of the garden city idea. In the light of the comments that have already made uh, about the traffic and about the size of the building, I question whether the proposed building offers the right employment for the Newton village. One final thing I want to say is that I appreciate that there's been no technical objection and that uh, the application conforms with national and local planning issues but I strongly support any new conditions that can be uh, arranged that would deal with the, the HGV issue and also uh, say something about enforcement because we've heard about conditions about traffic generation not being enforced with, uh, within the village already. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Calvert. So uh, size again of the building, traffic generation and this garden village terminology, which is... Uh, Debatable, I think, but uh, uh, can we just pick up with just try and reassure and answer, please? Of course, yeah. Um, the, 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 the reference to the existing hangars and the proximity to the existing buildings was, was an attempt on my behalf to show A, that existing relationships um, towards large buildings exist on site. And I fully acknowledge that the hangars themselves are smaller than what's being proposed. Um, as, as you rightly point out, sort of the dimensions that I've quoted in my report, I think as a, as a very crude calculation, um, this building would be similar to three of those hangars immediately side by side. Um, what the photographs on the screen show is that residential buildings have been permitted and indeed have been constructed in closer proximity to the longest side of the hangars than the buildings you are being asked to consider today. Um, the, the longest length of the proposal building, 153 metres, there are no residential buildings facing onto that, but I fully understand and accept the point you're making about its, its size and its scale. Um, the attempt to use the hangars was, was just a, a, an obvious reference, but you try and find comparisons. How big's a football pitch? We don't all follow football. Football pitches aren't a standard size. How big are other buildings in the area? We may not know them. So I, I tried to pick the obvious example of what's there on the screens. So hopefully that 
provides some clarity as to what to why that reference was in the report. In terms of traffic generation, uh, potential traffic, um, members who've been on committee previously will probably be able to second guess what I'm about to say. Those who've not will hear it more than once uh, during your tenure. Um, colleagues at the County Council Highways have assessed the traffic assessment, the traffic statement submitted at outline and as part of this reserve matters application and are not objecting. I won't profess to be a highways engineer. Um, I, I don't need or have full understanding of how the TRICS database works, but my, my general high level understanding is that they provide the data based on comparable size buildings elsewhere to show the level of traffic building that could potentially be generated by this and that they assume the worst case scenario. Um, I'll say it again, colleagues at the County Council of Highways, as the technical quantity have not objected, members need to bear that in mind when arriving at any determination of this application. Um, the reference to Garden Village, um, again, I fully understand what's being said about whether this is the right type of employment within this location. Um, I stand by the statement that the garden village designation is not something that's a policy requirement. I don't disagree with what you say about it being a, a laudable aspiration of the developer to, to do that. Nevertheless, we have an allocated site with outline permission with two commercial employment areas with residential buildings in the middle of it. Um, we don't know who the end user will be. Therefore, we can speculate, but we can't say with any certainty how many or what type of jobs they may be. I appreciate there'll be a mixture of office and B8 use, but whether that will be one person operating a number of robots or as the inference could be taken the other end of the spectrum, there are 122 parking spaces. It would imply that that's perhaps less likely to be the case. Um, in terms of um, your final point, sort of no tax objections. Again, I understand what you're saying in respect to that. Uh, thank you. Um, right. Yes. Reference to highways uh, is, as, as, as we've just heard, I, I, I haste, I was going to say it's, it's, a, it's not a joke, but, but very often on planning applications we're discussing here, it has been noted over the years that highways very, very rarely do raise objections to applications, whatever, whether it's one like this or housing or, or whatever. Uh, and it becomes almost a standing little phrase uh, that so we get used to. But however, it has to be said that when you read through the report at, at an earlier stage of this application, they did raise concerns uh, and which which have been uh, have been uh, dealt with by uh, as a result of the comments made by or the initial c concerns raised by highway. So I'm just putting a bit of defense in there for uh, they don't automatically uh, say nothing is a problem. But so, that, so they do look at things very carefully. Um, Councillor Phillips, you wanted to speak, I think. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think earlier on in the presentation, you mentioned that there were sections of off-road cycle path missing. Uh, is the plan to have the whole sort of section where the HGVs will use the road uh, to have off-road cycle paths? Chairman, through you. Um, it doesn't form part of this reserve matters approval or proposal. Sorry, get my term of the proposal. Um, however, the outline condition does require the road to be widened. Um, that would require the full consent and assessment of the highway authority. Whether they require that to be a footpath or a cycleway as part of that process, I cannot advise you, but it certainly doesn't form part of the reserve masses application to provide a cycle path to close the gap between the two, if that helps. Thank you. Uh, yep, you must come back. Um, could we make that one of the conditions? Because the, the, the thought of seeing that HGV, how tight it was on the road, and that, you know, something like that, trying to overtake a cyclist, especially, you know, a, a new estate with young children wobbling along the road, I think that should be a serious consideration. Uh, Chairman, um, I'm mindful that there, there are certain tests for imposing conditions on any planning application. Um, and, and one of them is that they have to relate to the harm arising from the proposal, so from this development, so not from the wider housing development, not from any wider shortfall in any cycle provision, but in relation to the harm arising from this proposal. At the risk of saying it again, it's not something that highways have raised or requested as part of the proposal. Um, so I would I would advise that 
if members were to impose that, it is likely to meet with a request from the applicants to remove it. Yeah. We would have to assess that against the technical guidance with the relevant consultee, in this case, the highway authority. I can't, I can't guess what they may say, but I've, I've got a fair, yeah. fair. But the, but the main point, but the, but the point has been raised and, 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 and noted as well. Um, right. Well, we, we had um, uh, quite a few discussions and comments on this. Councillor Ellis has, in effect, moved the recommendation, but with a request about the, the additional conditions. Yeah, I, I didn't actually oh, move it. Sorry, you, you were... Um, because you, um, you, you, were, you said, wait. Uh, I beg your pardon, I'll, I'll change that. You were, you were hinting that you would be minded to support. Yes, so I, yes. I will now propose. So you're proposing it, along with the the extra conditions we've referred to regarding the road safety and the turn issues. So yeah, if, if I can just clarify, Chairman, yes, uh, clarify not, not wanting to put words in anyone's mouth or be no, no. accused of leading the witness, but just for clarity's sake, I'm assuming this is conditions in relation to no left-hand turn for HGVs. Um, there was also discussion or request from Councillor Thomas about potential for solar panels on the roof. It's whether that forms part of your recommendation or not. That's entirely, as I say, I'm not going to lead the witness. I'm just going to raise it as a point that was raised. Yeah, <laughs> Councillor Ellis. Um, I would personally be very much in favour of that, but I don't think it's a condition that we should impose. Um, so the, the other issues which have been raised by uh, a number of people, uh, objectors and councillors, relates to stopping HGVs going through the village. And that really is key, I think. My, my only concern with putting conditions on is enforcement, and that is difficult. Um, but that's not a reason why we shouldn't do it. So, so we're clear on what we we want to add in on that, and you and you can word it appropriately when when the final report comes through. So, if, if members are happy, to, uh, assuming, to, assuming if members are happy, to, yes. if, if members vote that way and members are happy yeah. to to let officers do that, then yes, okay. that's something we can. So, uh, Councillor Chaplin. Thank you. So, just to clarify, because I would support a condition asking them to put solar panels it seems an obvious place rather than to build fields with solar panels to put them on the top of the roofs of big buildings. So, I mean, obviously, if we can't, we can't, but I would support it if we possibly could. Right. For, for clarity, Chair, again, not presuming anything, if members were minded to, officer advice would be that you could allow officers to impose a condition requiring a scheme to be submitted. Yeah. It might be the case that they come up with a te technical reason why that's not possible. So I don't want to promise the earth and under deliver potentially, but we can, it's certainly within your gift to impose a condition that requires them to submit a scheme to demonstrate measures for environmental improvements. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Ellis. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not opposed to solar panels, and if members wish to impose that condition, um, I, I would go along with it. That's very that's helpful. Thank you, uh, Councillor um, Brown. Thank you, Chair. I'm actually um, happy to second the proposal, as long as the, all the conditions are met, uh, and I also support um, the views of the solar panels as well, and the um, weight restriction for HDVs turning left. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Right, so so we've got the the, uh, the oh, Councillor Thomas. Um, could I make one further suggestion about conditions, and that is that the condition in the outline approval uh, for the widening of the road is restated as a condition on the reserved master's application. Thank you. Uh, to make it absolutely clear that this particular building cannot start operating until the road has been widened. Okay. The answer to that is, Councillor, uh, Chairman, um, the, the answer is that we are not permitted to reimpose conditions, but we can add a note to applicants making it explicitly clear that that is one of many conditions they are required to comply with before development operates in this particular instance. Councillor Calvert. 
Uh, yeah, just to be absolutely clear about the conditions for the HGVs, we've said about turning left. That's left out, but it's also right. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Right. Okay. Um, I think we've had a quite a good discussion on this, and we've raised the points and heard what our uh, uh, visitors have to say. Uh, we've got the recommendation moved and seconded. I think that's we better have a vote on this. So those in favour of the recommendation as discussed and agreed with the additional conditions as well, please show. I think that's unanimous, but just the, oh no, it's not, I beg your pardon. No, so I've got the different specs on. And anyone against? One against. So um, permission is granted with the conditions, uh, extra conditions are discussed. Thank you very much for everybody's input on that. I think we had a good discussion on that and we, we picked up on what the concerns of the village are, which are understandable that um, uh, we have to make these decisions right. So on to our next application, which is um, six mains. Oh, sorry, yes, Councillor Thomas needs to stand down from this. So just move the chairs around a bit. Okay, so we'll move on to the next application now. This is 6 Main Street, Stamford on Saw, and uh, it's the erection of a new single storey side and rear extension, a provision of a 1.8 metre high boundary fence, and construction of retaining wall and steps to the rear. And uh, Mrs. Gaskell, please, if you'll talk us through this. Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, I'm Rachel Gaskell, case officer for this proposal. 6 Main Street, Stamford on Saw. So the proposal is seeking full planning permission and listed building consent for the erection of a single storey side and rear extension to an existing grade two listed dwelling. So if we put the first slide on there, that shows us the location plan and the aerial photograph with the red line. It's not as clear, but it is hopefully it is on there. So this dwelling, along with the terrace in which it sits, is listed for group value only. So you will have noted from the report that in addition to the erection of the extension, the listed building cons consent includes slightly different elements. These include the demolition of the existing single storey side extension. You can just be seen there, that's a photograph of the front elevation. And to the left hand side is a single storey side extension. And um, it also includes works to the parapet to prevent water ingress, the insertion of a fire break wall in the loft space and the replacement of modern floor tiles to the ground floor. So if we go back again, we'll see that the site sits on a large plot and it benefits from vehicular access via village farm close, which leads to a tim detached timber garage and off street parking provision. Oh, these haven't got them so I'll just take you through the photograph. So we've seen the front elevation with that existing single storey side extension. Then there's a view from the parking bay by the Lich Gate at St John the Baptist Church. That's looking back with six Main Street in the distance. And the key thing there is the um, boundary wall with hedge, which does actually belong to the property closest to us on the photograph, which is Village Farmhouse. Um, and that's Bounds Air Garden. Uh, then we've got a view looking the other way from when I was standing in the parking bay. And there, there's the other terraced row of listed properties and the frontage complex of what was Village Farm. To the rear of there are modern barn conversion dwellings, which could be seen. 
So here's a close view of the side extension as existing um, from Main Street and then from within the site. This is the rear elevation and the rear elevation of the terrace row, including an existing extension to the other end property, which is in brick with a pitched roof. This is the parking area and detached garage looking to the side elevation of the application dwelling and then from just about at the bottom of the garden looking all the way back with the church in the background. Then again we've got actually see the lich gate here this these um, photos were taken another few weeks on um, as you can tell that the hedge is now coming to leaf um, and then views of the towards the site from the path with, well, that's going to the church entrance, the entrance to the church on the far side of the building. Uh, again, this is from close to the church entrance, looking back, viewing east, you can't really see it. And then again, you can see the side of the application property there, and you can just about make out the top of the existing side extension. So, onto the um the slides onto the submitted plans so this is the existing and proposed site plan so you can see the footprint of the extension there and the hedging which is to be removed and that which is proposed to be planted along that northern boundary following the well it's, it's currently a fence line timber fence and going back towards the detached timber garage uh, this is proposed to be at 2.75 metres in height from the ground level of Main Street, and that's in keeping with that adjoining the site, and a condition is proposed to control this. The, um, these are the proposed elevations, and they show structural contemporary design. It incorporates glazed link to the existing dwelling, clear story glazing, and a lightweight roof structure. The extension would be constru constructed of materials including vertical oak timber cladding to the walls, bronze aluminium windows and doors with a grey standing seam roof. These are considered to be complementary to both the host dwelling and the wide area. The overall height of the extension would be 0.4 metres below the existing single storey side extension, so the pitch of that roof. This is the floor plan of the extension, and that shows that it would provide additional living space, utility area, and an ensuite bedroom. You can also see there that the openings will be focused adjacent to the host dwelling, um, right next to the rear elevation, and also within the within the existing rear elevation, sorry, also within the rear elevation of the proposed extension looking down the garden. And the final slide we've got here is that of the 3D visual models, and that shows that on account of its sighting at the rear of the dwelling, together with the existing and proposed hedging vegetation, ensure that it is not clearly visible within the street scene from Main Street. So there were a number of concerns raised during the application, as can be seen in the report. These did include access during the construction process, as has been explained, that is a private legal matter. Residential amenity was um, was raised as a concern in terms of overlooking and loss of privacy. The proposed extension is single storey scale and on account of the layout and the position of the openings, together with the distance from the boundary and the presence of existing established vegetation, this is not considered to be significantly adverse. The matter of design is a subjective matter. This is a contemporary styled extension using modern materials. Um, it does support the guidance in the Rushcliffe Residential Design Guide in that the style and design of the original dwelling should remain the dominant element with the extension subordinate to it. Subordinate doesn't necessarily mean just size. It's also relevant to design and materials. And in this case, it's sighting within the plot and visibility. So to conclude, it's the officer's view, including those of the conservation officer whose comments have been 
on the um, are available in, through the report that the principle is acceptable and the design and appearance whilst contemporary would not cause harm to the significance of the principal listed building in its setting nor to the special interest of the other listed buildings to which it is attached and in close proximity to in addition it would not result in significant adverse impact to neighboring occupants as such the proposal would comply with the objectives of the relevant policies of the development plan and guidance within the MPPF. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, we have um, two speakers on this item. Uh, we have uh, actually we have two speakers and also a written uh, comment as well, uh, which will be read out to us. So the first speaker is Mr. Nick Cooper, who is the agent for the applicant. So uh, thank you for your patience. And as you as you know, five up to five minutes, and it's the right hand button as soon as you're ready. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Our clients are passionate about living in this beautiful Grade Two listed building. They're keen to play their part in conserving and enhancing its character for future generations to enjoy. The building is a small, traditional two up, two down cottage sitting on a very large residential plot and they're looking to make alterations to allow the property to become their long-term family home. In order to do so, they need to extend the house. The proposals involve removing a small lean-to extension and forming a larger kitchen, a utility room, downstairs toilet, and a guest bedroom. Not an unusual request at all. Providing a floor area similar to that previously approved at number nine Main Street. Importantly, the application also covers works directly to enhance the existing building. Replacement of UPVC rainwater goods with heritage products, replacement of modern floor tiles, works to the parapet gable ends to alleviate damp problems, and the addition of a fire barrier within the communal roof space to safeguard the house and its neighbours in the worst case event of a fire. The proposed extension is single story and set at a low level, allowing the striking brickwork details on the original building to be revealed and viewed. The additional benefit of this is that it reduces the impact on the neighbouring houses, lessens the impact of the extension on the street scene, and it is a subordinate design allowing the listed building to be fully appreciated. New hedging along the northern site boundary replaces planting lost from within the site, reducing the biodiversity impact of the proposals and screening the existing poor quality fence panels from view. Yes, it is a contemporary design, purposefully so. Materials have been selected with the support of a specialist heritage consultancy to harmonise with and not just copy the existing building. This prevents a dilution of those special characteristics that have generated its listed status. Detailing of the eaves, the glaze link and the facing materials have been carefully considered and will be paramount to the success of this scheme, allowing the extension to sit alongside the original building rather than obscuring it, providing a high quality residential extension. Objectors were reported to be awaiting officers' comments prior to formalising their responses. The conservation officer is quite clear that the design and its treatment of an extension is an appropriate response to extending a listed building. And that conservation is a process of maintaining and managing change rather than preventing it. The design has been carefully developed to minimise visual impact on the street scene the setting of the church and the wider street context. All of these issues have been assessed and reported on by appropriate professionals in the application submission. He concludes that the, the harm of the proposal is, my, is at the minor end, uh, sorry, is minor, and at the lower end of the less than substantial scale. And when weighing up the proposals with the enhancements to the existing structure, the public benefits significantly outweigh the harm. We hope that you agree with the recommendation and approve this scheme. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cooper. Again, well, we're just within your five minutes, so thank you for that. Um, our next speaker is Leslie Way. 
So you're and you're speaking to object to the application. So so as uh, soon as you're ready, you know how it works. Up, up to, you've done it before. So it's up to five minutes. First photo on the screen. Uh, the repairs and updating to the listed building and the extension are being considered as one application, meaning that they're inextricably linked. However, one should not be dependent on the other. The design and access statement itemises the internal and external alterations and interventions. We have no issue with these proposals. The work proposed to restore and preserve the grade list two listed buildings should be carried out regardless of the outcome of the application for the extension. We see no reason to decline these parts of the application and accept the removal of the later added lean to. However, there are serious concerns about the scale and design of the proposed extension. Taking into account the size of the extension and the floor area of the current building, the property will almost double in size. Hence, the proposed extension cannot be considered subordinate to the original building. <clears throat> this proposal is indeed different enough to make it obvious it is an addition but the design has no intrinsic beauty. <laughs> the design of the extension makes the building completely out of character for the area, comparing the roof to the one on the grade one listed church opposite, dating from medieval times and restored in the 1880s and 90s seems preposterous. Pitch two, please. Talking of the church, local historians describe the church as follows. The site itself is quite distinctive, only in 18th century farm buildings in view across the road, an untouched corner of old England. The introduction of a modern building will destroy the character of this site and it will be visible from the church grounds. Sorry, that should have been on photo one. The hedge along the wall on Main Street doesn't belong to the applicants, so there can be no assumption it will continue to provide screening for the extension. The conservation officer states that the need for screening suggests something which is known to be harmful. Comparisons have been made with the extension on the cottage at number two, which you can see here. However, it blends in, has no windows overlooking the neighbours and is much smaller than this application. Having another unsuitable building won't improve anything. Two wrongs won't make it right. Photo three, please. The visibility of the extension from the rear would detract from the character of the cottages and their accompanying outbuildings, which you can see here themselves having well-preserved character relating to the history and function of the cottages. The design and access statement fails to mention the double doors from the family room as shown on the proposed floor plan submitted on the 5th of April. These were faced directly across the garden of number seven. This part of the site is narrow and the elevation to the side will be close to next door with inadequate screening and an oppressive impact on the area of their back garden between the house and the outbuildings. The residents at number seven have serious concerns about how the boundary will be treated and how much of the existing vegetation will be lost, thus reducing the privacy of their garden. There are concerns about the use of a private driveway for construction vehicles, and the agent says that construction could take place via the entrance from Main Street. Photo five, please. This would mean construction vehicles being parked on a narrow street near a sharp bend, which is just where you can see the car coming towards you. <clears throat> and there could be danger to other road users, traffic congestion and damage to verges and pavements. Although this is not a material planning consideration, should this application be granted, we request that a construction management plan is provided and signed off under an additional condition before work is started. Please refuse this application on the grounds of impact on the amenity of the neighbours. It would not appear as a subservient addition to the host property. It would create an entirely unbalanced appearance to the terrace row. A negative impact on the setting of the listed cottages from both the street and from the rear and of the grade one listed church. Modern design is out of keeping with the terrace with no particular merits of its own. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Way. Thank you very much for that. So, uh, oh yes, and we have um, a written representation from Councillor Barney, uh, who is the since following the boundary changes recently. Councillor Barney is the ward member. 
that area now. Uh, he's not with us today, but he sent some, uh, some comments in. So if you could read those out, please. I'm sorry I'm not able to attend today due to a prior long-standing engagement at NCC. Due to the boundary changes of Soar Valley Ward and the recent elections, I've arrived late to review this application. However, I want to assure the committee that I've looked thoroughly at all the application documentation and I have visited the site. As such, I note the many amendments proposed from the original submitted scheme. On balance, I conclude that I fully concur with the statements previously submitted by both councillors Way and Thomas and also Stanford on Soar Parish Council. The application has gone to tremendous lengths in an attempt to mitigate the impact of this development, which adjoins a grade two listed building and surrounded community of other sympathetic listed and historically significant buildings. Despite these efforts, the proposed extension and arguably any proposed extension at this location would have a detrimental impact on the conservation and historical rural vernacular of this location. This extension adjoins a row of traditional terraced farm workers' cottages. To my mind, it changes the balance and nature of these former estate cottages, making this end terrace stand apart and arguably at odds with the rest of the row and the other traditional buildings in the area. I perceive that it would be visible from a number of vantage points, not least to the rear from the rear of the neighbouring terraces. So for these reasons, along with others cited by the former ward councillors and parish council, I believe that this is not in keeping with surrounded buildings and indeed this part of Stanford on Soar. Right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so we have no other comments on this at this stage. We just need to just pick up on, on some of the comments that have been made. So we heard from uh, the applicant's agent uh, who, who just uh, uh, tells us of the reasoning and, uh, and the thinking behind the application, uh, including uh, accepting the fact that it's a mod modern um, uh, alteration, but also they are very keen to keep the character of the property. Uh, Councillor Way, though, says uh, doesn't agree and uh, thinks it will be out of character and also referred to, um, or, or she didn't object to the, the re restoration of the original part, but is not happy about the, some of the aspects of the proposed new parts. And then we've just heard the comments from Councillor Barney uh, about uh, character, etc. Do you want to pick up on any of those, please, just to help us out? And then, then we'll go into a discussion. Thank you, um, Chairman. So I just remind members that we have to consider the application before us, which is the whole application. So in terms of the list of building, there are repairs proposed. There are also extensions. So we can't pick and choose which elements we um, determine today. We need to determine it as a whole package. Um, the only other point I was going to pick up on was um, a construction management plan. It's unusual for a property or a development of this size um, with householder extensions. They're usually on much larger schemes, um, but it's something that members might wish to, to discuss in the debate today and, and, and see how they feel about that. Um, I don't think there's anything else to pick up on, Chairman. Uh, right, thank you very much. So, uh, members, um, Councillor Brown. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I know this area very well. Grew up around there. Know the fields all around there. Um, I'm not happy with it at all, to be honest. Um, one of the conditions that uh, for the application is that they grow a hedge, 2.75 metres in height, um, and not to be removed without permission. So to me, that implies um, that permission may be given. And also the hedge of that type takes, uh, it will take three years to grow to that height. So you're going to have three years without any screening whatsoever. Uh, that's assuming that the hedge is properly maintained for the duration of the three years. Um, and also it's been mentioned before that the hedge at the front of, uh, along their neighbouring property doesn't belong to them, belongs to the neighbouring property. And what happens if they do decide to move the, uh, remove that hedge, which they're quite entitled to do so, um, it will be actually then be more visible, this extension. And if you do know the area, the church across, I, I just wish that the 3D uh, uh, images that were on the slides did actually um, show the church, because if you could see the church in reality, compared to the photographs, it is, it's much closer. The photographs make it look further away. 
and also the ground at the church is slightly raised up so if you're actually on the on the churchyard it would become visible um it also mentions in the application that uh, number nine has a side extension um which is similar it's not it's made of bricks and it's made of a similar type of brick that blends in with the rest of the properties um it's totally out of character to the rest to the rest of the village and um I, and I, I won't be i won't be supporting the application okay thank you councillor brown um uh, probably no need to come back on that i think uh, you've made made the points very clear uh, any, uh, uh is that an indication to speak get, get councillor walker uh, thank you chair um i'm struggling with this one a little bit i suppose or you know in in um um, I'm very much looking forward to uh, what I hope is an interesting debate on it. Um, my attention is drawn in particular to the conservation aspects and some of the input from the conservation officer, um, referring us to uh, a test at paragraph 202 of MPPF, which, I've, which I, as I've understood it correctly, is um, having assessed that it's at the less than substantial harm level, which might be something that we that assessment might be something separate that we agree that if it is placed there then the next part of the test is to weigh the harm against the public benefits i, I can't see at the moment what the public benefits are at paragraph 40 um at paragraph 44 of the report there's a quote there that says public benefits should flow from the proposed developments they should be of a nature or scale to be a benefit to the public at large and not just be a private benefit. However, benefits don't always have to be visible or accessible to the public in order to be genuine public benefits. For example, works to a listed private dwelling which secure its future as a designated heritage asset. Now, as I sort of understand the narrative of the application, the works are to secure its future as a family dwelling rather than as a rather than as a designated heritage asset now secure you know that which is a totally acceptable laudable um objective none of us i'm sure would would, would come here to this committee um looking to restrict a uh, owners or occupiers of property from um, reconfiguring the properties to how they would want to use it as a family. But, it, you know, so I suppose I'm asking, is my reading of that paragraph and this particular area of the policy correct? Or are there aspects of public benefit here which are missing? Can we help with that then, the public benefits explanation? Yeah, and so the way I would um, try and explain it is in terms of the public benefit, the listed building in itself is a, the preservation of it is a public benefit. So the creation of the fire break, um, the prevention of any damp or deterioration, you are therefore um, preserving that building and its benefit to the wider public in terms of its historic significance as a listed building. So that's the, the public benefit side of it. So I hope that helps a little bit. Kind of, because I don't think I don't, it's not the repairs, for want of a better phrase, that I think are at issue. It's the harm judged at less than substantial, but harm of the extension. And we're being asked to weigh that against the public benefit, which is the repair. And the repair isn't really part of the extension. The repair relates to the existing property, so I, I can't quite see the connection between the public benefit. You know, I can conceive of a situation where the public benefits outweigh the harm of the extension. I can't see here how the repairs to the existing. I don't, I don't think anyone's saying unless we get the extension, we're not going to do the repairs, or the repairs aren't required in order to. Um, Aren't, you know, aren't, 
you know, if there was an ex uh, a rear extension, let's say, and there were repairs required internally, which for them facilitated for building purposes, an extension going out the back, then maybe I could see it. But perhaps I'm missing something. I don't know. Oh, well, yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. It's quite a hard concept to get um, your head round. So I think we've got to consider is this is a package of works that take place all together to um, bring this home into um, further use. So there is no, at the moment, the building is not in such a condition that we would require those works. There's no, we haven't got any issue with it. We're not serving notices or anything like that. So these additional works to preserve the building are something the owner is undertaking as part of an overall package. And we're considering that overall package, which is um, how we're weighing that public benefit. But it is something for you as committee members to decide how much weight you're going to give that. So you, you can have that that debate and that thought process as officers we think that is significant enough that the the level of harm from the extension is is on the lower end and the level of benefit of the repairs does outweigh that so it, to us as officers that is that is a balanced argument but that is for you to determine and debate um, as you wish okay thank you and, and also again i mean i'm just picking up on that point i i i i'm reading a lot of the conservation officers comments um, which basically can concur with that. Uh, Councillor um, uh, uh, Ellis. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Um, I think uh, Councillor Walker has really got to the nub of the matter. Um, if, if this application is to stand or fall on public benefit, it seems to me quite clear that the public benefit um, is considerably outweighed by the disadvantage of a disproportionate or disproportionately sized extension. Um, in, in my experience, that alone would probably cause it to fail more often than not. So if it's if our only choice is to support or reject, then I would be in favour of rejecting. And I, I don't particularly like rejecting planning applications, um, but this seems to me to be to be one where officers recommendations strike the wrong balance. OK, well, we, we, yes, for, that's what we're here for at the end of the day is to to make it make a, a, a decision. Now, bear in mind if you or, or anyone is minded to make an alternative recommendation, i.e. in this case to refuse, you need to be prepared with some material planning reasons as to as to why to do so, because so so you might want to have those in mind. I, I sense yeah, you're I, coming I, back I, already on that. I think that the two main ones um, I, I actually mentioned, well, one is the, the, the balance of public benefit against public detriment and I think that speaks for itself. Um, and the other um, is the disproportionate size of the extension. That is a very material planning matter. Come back on, on those as well. No. Fine, OK. Um, uh, Councillor Calvert. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I've, just, I've been reading paragraph 44 and responding to Councillor. Walker's uh, points. The way I was looking at it was would the works result in the heritage asset being de designated? And uh, I get the impression from what the conservation officer said is that if the works took place, the, uh, the designation would remain, it wouldn't be affected. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, the listing isn't in, in doubt, it would remain a listed building. Uh, with with the works taking place. Yeah. Okay, Councillor Councillor Wells. Thank you, Chair. If there's a concern about the hedge and the time it grows, why can't we put a condition in that the uh, there's a, a fence put put in its place, a green one? Thank you. Yeah. So, it's not part of the submission. No, it's not, it, it isn't part of the submission, and a fence of that height would require planning. Yeah. 
planning permission there is a fence along that boundary at present um it's of, of um standard 1.8 meter high okay well at least we know that we you, you yeah. understand the, the situation with the fence now um right so there's no other comments coming in i suspect i uh so in effect then we've got a proposal for ref refusal um with the for the reasons that have just been explained on uh, public benefits versus detriment and disproportionate size so that's been moved by so you're move, are you moving that? yeah so uh councillor ellis is moving that do, uh, do you have a seconder for that Council, Councillor Brown, you're seconding that. I'm happy to right second now. that, Chair. Yeah. So uh, I, I sense there's no one else really anxious to speak on this. So um, so we've now so we've got the um, the recommendation to refuse permission for reasons given, moved and seconded. So we'll take a vote on that. So what you'll be voting on now is whether you're for or against this alternative recommendation to refuse permission. That's correct, isn't it? Could you, yes, and you could clarify the reason, just please. So if I just clarify from my notes, so I I think what um, Councillor Ellis is, was the effect of that the public benefit of the proposals does not outweigh the less than substantial harm to the listed building identified. And the second reason relates to the disproportionate size of the proposed extension in relation to the host dwelling. So you, 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 that, you're happy with those reasons, right? Okay. So are we clear what we're doing? Then we're, we're voting on on the new recommendation to refuse. So show of hands in favour of that that recommendation, please. That's one, two, three, four. Is uh, okay. Is that four? Yeah. Uh, those against that recommendation. One, two, three, four, five. So that proposal is is lost. Okay, so we now do we go back to the substantive? So we go back to carry on because so that that motion has been lost, hasn't it? So we carry on with the discussion with, with a new, hopefully, a new recommendation. So we need to carry on discussing what we're going to um, going to do on this one. Then, so does anyone wish to move perhaps an alternative um, recommend, uh, Councillor Wells? I recommend we 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 accept it. So, so your recommendation, you're moving that the re, the original recommendation yes. in the report to grant permission That's is right. is approved. That's your yeah. recommendation. Have you got a seconder for that, please? Well, I'm happy to second that. So, will uh, anyone else wish to speak on this, or shall we go to a vote? So. Let's have a vote, please. This we're now voting on the original recommendation to grant permission as per the report. That's correct, isn't it? So yeah. So show of hands in favour of that, please. So one, two, three, four, five. And uh, those against. One, two, three, four. And there won't be any abstentions. So that means decisions taken to grant permission as per the report. Uh, thank you, though, for your 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 comments. And 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 this is one of the things about the planning committee. Uh, it's things are always finally balanced, and it's important that all arguments for and against, whether it's an extension or whatever application, are fully heard. And I think we had a good discussion on that. So uh, thank you for your contributions on that. Um, right, our, uh, our next application is, uh, this is the, who's doing this one? It's Mr. Mountain, isn't it? Yes, that's right. So. So, uh, right, this is our final application for the day. This is the Alfresco kiosk in uh, Bridgeford Park. Uh, this is a construction of a single story flat roofed extension. And uh, I think, well, we'll hear from Mr. Mountain who's going to talk through this. I think the main reason we have it before us is because it's a borough application. But uh, Mr. Mountain, if you just talk us through, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Yeah, as the Chair has pointed out, it's a very modest application. Uh, sorry. Very modest application, uh, only brought to committee because it's a borough council building. Let's get to the photo, there we go. Al Fresco Cafe now, Little Green Cafe in Bridgeford Park. And it's just a very modest extension, which is going to sit on the rear of the site uh, here, just to provide an independent toilet facility for the new owners of the, uh, sorry, the new occupier, the, the new tenants of the cafe. Historically, the Alfresco tenants have had to use the, um, the public facilities uh, and it's been deemed that they'd like to have their own toilet facilities. Uh, the extension is 2.1 metres deep, 4.3 metres wide, finished with a flat roof, uh, very similar to what's already in situ. Um, consideration has been had to the setting of Bridgeford Hall, which is about 50 metres away, which is grade two listed. Um, but given the scale of the extension, we don't consider there to be uh, any detrimental impact to the hall. Um, it is in a flood zone. Um, it is in flood zone two, like the rest of the building. But again, the floor levels will remain consistent with the rest of the building. Uh, so it's not considered to result in any greater flood risk than uh, already exists at the site. And it roughly extends uh, just beyond the railings. If you can see where the mouse is, uh, is the mouse coming through? Yeah, just, just coming through to roughly where the railings are is this sort of approximate projection out at the back of the building. Finished in brick to match, uh, flat roof to match the existing. And I'll leave it there if uh, members have any questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions about that? Oh, Councillor, mm -hmm. Councillor Calvert, <laughs> only because the local member uh, has asked me to raise this. Uh, she went to, Councillor Plant went to see the staff and their only concern about the development, and it was, I wouldn't say it's a concern, was that the current extractor fan is on the back of the existing building. When the extension is built, the extractor fan will be facing into the, the new, the, into the extension, so it will need to be moved. And they want to just have certainty that the extractor fan will be replaced. Uh, probably not, <laughs> but anyway. I'm... Yeah, I had the uh, I had the same discussion with uh, with Councillor Plan a couple of days ago, uh, and she couldn't see it on the plan, and it is very small. But in effect, they're going to relocate it to this. So existing, it's sort of roughly where the mouse is on the back wall of the building. Sort of, as you say, it extracts into the toilet, which is not ideal. And they're going to shuffle it down that back wall, which you can see on that elevation there. So it just moves to the edge of the building. So it should still be functional uh, in that back edge of the building. Uh, sorry, I, I forgot to put my microphone on. We need someone to move and second the recommendation. So who would like to move the recommendation to approve? Uh, Councillor Phillips, have you got a seconder? Councillor Calvert. So we've had the um, recommendation moved and seconded as per the report. Those in favour, please show. And um, that's unanimous, no one against, so permission is, is given. So thank you for that. Uh, the final item on the agenda is, um, we, 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 we have this on most planning committee agendas now, it's a report of uh, appeals, because uh, at the end of the day, world of planning, every now and again, people will appeal against the decision. And uh, we, we have a report here of uh, some recent appeal decisions some of which are dismissed, some of which are allowed. Uh, Mrs Dodd, I think you'd like to talk to us about a couple of these, wouldn't you? Thank you, Chairman. I don't normally talk about the appeals. Um, I normally just ask you to, to note them. And if you've got any questions, can I ask the officers? But I just wanted to draw your attention to the first one on there, which is the, um, the traveller site. So if I just find my copy of it. Thank you. So it's Springview, Flinton Lane, Scribeaton. And I just wanted to draw your attention to it because it was um, it's a traveller site that was permitted by the inspector already a few years ago, um, but with personal permissions for travellers. Um, and we found um, through our enforcement process that the site had been subdivided and let out to two other people. 
So as a borough council, we went through quite a protracted investigation and enforcement process, and we did serve enforcement notices, which went to appeal. Um, we had a hearing, um, which was, again, delayed quite considerably by the inspectorate, but we did actually um, win those appeals. So we've had two enforcement notices upheld um, and our decision to refuse um, some changes to the planning application. Um, which felt like quite a success story, given the amount of um, time and effort that, that went into it. So I did just want to draw your attention to that as, as quite a good success that we'd had recently. Um, and I'll just let you um, look through the others at your own leisure. Thank you. OK, thank you. Does anyone, I'm conscious of the fact that most members here are new, so won't be so familiar with some of these applications, but does anyone have any questions or comments? Um, uh, but uh, the, the usual thing to do is, is, as time goes on, in between meetings, con have discussions with the case officers as and when members feel, feel the need to. Just what, one, one thing I'll mention is um, uh, an appeal that was allowed, so it went, went against a decision we made. Um, there was an application, the Cherry Street Bingham one, I remember this, because we, we, it was discussed uh, towards the end of last year, I think and uh, the, there was a long discussion I remember we had a very long debate in here about it, it was for an extension uh, domestic extension and the original um, recommendation was to grant permission but on the day the, the committee had various concerns uh, I can't remember the precise reasons now but it was all to do the committee was concerned about um, the views from the church I think if I remember correctly and so the committee turned it down, but not surprisingly, the applicant went to appeal and uh, and it was allowed. But uh, it, so, so they got their permission in the end. But there again, we're here, as I said earlier on, we're a committee and we're here to make decisions. And uh, sometimes people will agree and sometimes people won't. And um, that's one of the uh, uh, fascinations and the important things that we do. So um, there's no other questions on, or comments on the appeal. So can I thank everybody for your attendance and uh, your contributions and especially new colleagues it's a bit of a baptism of fire it's and planning is so high profile as well and it can be very emotive at times understandably so but uh, uh that's it's it's what we're here to do so thank you very much and we'll close the meeting at 4 35 so thank you